Creativity has been a fundamental cognitive process involved in problem solving and communication. But what is it that makes us pick up a tool like a pencil and mark a piece of paper with a drawing? Are we just marking our existence in a time and place? To explore creativity, I came up with eight questions that I asked a wide range of people, from creativity researchers and psychologists to creatives from all walks of life, visual artists, musicians, cooks, comedians, and filmmakers. Hello. Hi, hi, Andrew. Dr. Glavanu, would you explain your uh, 5A model of creativity? Of course, so the 5A model came out of um, a frustration with how individualistic um, typical models of creativity are in the sense that they, they focus us a lot on the person and the mind of the person kind of in isolation from the rest. And as we know, when we create, we do many things at once. We don't only think creatively, we don't only have ideas, but we interact with other people. We use objects, right? We, we create prototypes. I personally love making schemas on paper. So how do we account for all of these elements when we think about the creative process? So a traditional model was the, and is continues to be the 4P model of creativity, which is person, process, product, and press or place. Press is actually quite indicative of how many people think about the environment as something that kind of constrains you and, and presses you and pressures you into either creating or kind of stopping your creativity. So how can we think in a more integral way of, of, of these elements, right? So I, I came up with this 5A model, and it's not that I'm in love with everything with the letter A, but it just came naturally that I would think of the creative actor, the audience, the action, the artifacts and the affordances. The creative actor is basically the person, right? But it can also be a group, it can also be a community. So who is the actor? Who is the kind of agent of creativity? The second, the audience. Every creator has an audience. Every creator needs to persuade others of his or her creativity, of what they're proposing, right? And we create for other people and with other people. So there are many various audiences that are involved action so just not not just the creative thinking but acting or doing something in the world when i say creative action i mean a more integral view of thinking and making stuff creatively uh, artifacts artifacts is a funny one because normally people think of museums you know the artifact is something exhibited and so on Actually, everything that is in a museum is a product of creativity, even if by now they're not new and original anymore, but they're a product of, of human creativity. At the same time, if you take the, the scribbles of a child on paper, that is a cultural artifact. They use culture to produce culture. So everything creative, you know, the outcome of it, whether it's an idea or an object or a value or an institution is an artifact. And finally, maybe the, the most peculiar one is affordances. So affordances refers to the materiality of creating because we, again, we don't only create in the head, but we use what the environment gives us. So objects around us afford certain actions and don't afford others if you have a broom you can you can have a clean room you can play with it and pretend you're now you're you're somewhere in a magical place and so on um or you can but you cannot go to the physical moon with the help of a broom so it has certain affordances but not others what we do when we create is basically we perceive new affordances in the objects around us if you, if you take a creative actor, right, and, and they look at a, at a pencil, most people would see a normal pencil, but maybe they would see, I don't know, they would think of, of some kind of complicated carbon structure that it comes from the same object. So their, their vision affords much more in view of the object. So creativity is, is uh, basically, if I want to summarize with all the A's, if I see if I can manage, is basically creative actors engaging with a variety of audiences and engage in a variety of actions that use new affordances and new possibilities of the environment in creating new and meaningful artifacts. There you go, the five A's of creativity. Excellent, great. <laughs> All right, so my questions, uh, the seven I usually ask people, hmm. I know you've not seen them. Um, do you want me to type them in the chat real quickly? No, or no, no, no. I, I love just being, you know, kind of improvising. <laughs> All right, number one, what is creativity? Mm, what is creativity? 
Well, creativity is many things to many people. First of all, I am a psychologist, so I'm kind of biased towards a specific understanding of creativity, but I'm also the kind of psychologist, I'm a sociocultural psychologist, so I'm kind of a psychologist that looks towards culture and society, perhaps more than other fellow psychologists would. So if you take a very psychological understanding, which a lot of people do, creativity is a mental ability or or skill, if you want. For some people, it's also an attitude, so a creative attitude towards life. You encounter a situation, you encounter a problem, and you want to do something creative about it. But as you notice, again, these things are very, very internal to the person. So in psychology, we have this product definition that is very famous, and a lot of people use it because it's just easier to think of creativity as the generation of things that are novel and original on the one hand, and meaningful, appropriate, valuable on the other. To me and to my mind, I'm trying to expand a bit um, the range of things that we call creative. And I, I often refer to the production of meaningful novelties. For me, the word meaningful is very important because again, you know, you can think of uh, Mona Lisa as a creative outcome and obviously it has a great value, historical, financial as well. But what do we do with, you know, a great meal that you've put together or even a way in which you fantasize about a next holiday that is very meaningful to you and your development, but maybe not for a museum, right? So creativity is this process leading to the creation of meaningful novelties that happens in between person and world, you know, other people, places, objects, culture, institutions, and so on. That is what creativity is for me. Excellent. <clears throat> I've heard that definition a lot. And <laughs> right. just to me, like, uh, I have a degree in psychology and I also have, I'm also an artist, right? So Excellent. I'm both straddle both worlds right and, um, when i hear that definition i'm like that is such a subjective right. definition right. like more objective to say well no that's definitely not new mm. <laughs> that's not novel but to some people they maybe have never seen something that other people have had. so this other thing that may not be novel for the rest right. of culture like or society yeah. for this one person yeah. it is and then exactly. meaning, that's exactly. totally subjective <laughs> Well, and, and, and that's that's important, you know, I mean, just, just to pick up a little bit on that, I'm one of those people who doesn't believe that creativity is, a, is an intrinsically objective property that exists within the object or within the person. There are some people who almost believe something like that. But if you think about it, what we call creativity today or what we call creative today is not what we would have called maybe some years ago. It's not going to be what we call years from now. It's not, it's not what people call in China creative, perhaps what we call here, right? So so the label of creativity is a socially constructed label. I mean, you, you can just not go about, you know, around that. Novelty, surprise, you can measure those. Th those are okay to measure. But creativity is socially constructed. It's a convention that we use in society. So that's why, and this might be a, a radical statement, but the neuroscience of creativity has a lot to offer to our understanding. Because the, if there is no brain, there is no person, there is no create, you know, creation happening. But you cannot locate creativity in the brain. You can locate, if you want, maybe some kind of beginning of ideas that are maybe novel, I don't know. But creativity is about the dialogue in society about what we value. That is what creativity is about. And, and you know, if you want to understand it like that, good. If you want to reduce it to novelty, I think you would be losing a lot of that societal aspect and cultural aspect of it. Right, exactly. Um, where does creativity come from? I know mm. you just talked about <laughs> neuroscience and the brain. I did yeah. actually talk to a neurologist and she's like, well, I can point out where it comes from. <laughs> <laughs> right, right here. Uh, yeah. But, but, <laughs> but where does creativity come where from? Where does creativity come from? Yeah, thank you for asking this question because I creativity comes in a way from the person because I, I'm still a psychologist. So obviously the person is a very important unit of analysis for me, but it's not an isolated person. I think creativity comes a lot from our life experience. It's really about our entire trajectory, things that we accumulate and we can build upon and reuse. You know, in creativity, what we do basically is combine. Um, think about it. Think about just a simple example. You know, if I ask you or anyone, think of an alien, right? An alien form, alien form of life that is something that we have never seen on earth. No one can do that because whatever we imagine 
builds on what exists even the craziest looking at aliens that are kind of amorphous and you know we have vapor we have air we have that that's we anchor everything in our experience so if we if we do that that means that actually the more we have experience social cultural physical and otherwise the more we have a, a good baggage to be able to combine and recombine things and then there is another element and, and that element has to do with where people are in society you know we all form networks and communities and ideas circulate among those networks for some individuals they're at the at this great junction uh, either because they they looked for it or just by chance sometimes in which you know different types of ideas kind of uh, um, come to them and they have this unique perspective because they can see the world you know i'm an artist and an engineer and and by by virtue of that i can build on these two types of experience and put them together differently so i think a lot of it has to do with life experience encountering culture and and the way you're positioned in the world as well nice why do we create why do people do that why do we create for a variety of reasons so um you know if we go back in psychology we have this um, old distinction between intrinsic and extrinsic motivation i don't think it, it it really holds in practice in that way because we do things uh in a poly motivated way but you know just going back to that i think we create because of our internal nature if i may or the need to express ourselves i think every person has this need that is very tied to their psychological health and well-being because if you look at people who are in very oppressive life circumstances or you know totalitarian regimes or you know just unable to express themselves that does leave a mark on the person so we have almost this natural need to to um leave a mark on the world and and to put something of ourselves in the world but then we also create because we want to belong and we want to be recognized and and sometimes we want to just you know make money or or make make a life for ourselves and i think sometimes for some lucky people who manage to build up that social and cultural capital and and be recognized as creators all of these motivations can meet you know you create because of of, of a passion and intrinsic kind of um yeah passion you have for the topic but also because it brings you recognition and you know recognition is not a bad thing i think we we would we would do well to value creativity more in society because that is the motivator for a lot of people to say that is a life path i would like to to take yeah all right uh, do the rhythms and cycles of artistic expression, so when somebody is very productive and then the times when they're not, right? does that have anything to do with the uh, rhythms and cycles of the natural world? So daytime, nighttime, uh, summer, winter, life, death. Right. You know? Oh, that's a very interesting question. I mean, you know, I am a holistic I try to be a holistic thinker. So I definitely want to embed the person, as you saw, uh, in society for sure. But why not in nature as well? I mean, we talked a little bit about the brain. I think we shouldn't forget the body in all of this, you know, because it's not just the isolated brain, but our whole being in a, in a kind of integrated way. So I definitely think because there is such an influence of seasons and, and you know, night, day on our biorhythm and, and our level of energy and, you know, people have different kind of um, rhythms there as well, it must have an impact on creating. What I can tell you for sure is that, you know, there, there is a lot of value in habits and, and rhythms of creating that you build as an individual. So a lot of us think of creativity as something that just happens all of a sudden, you know, it's the moment of inside, the aha moment, and, and sometimes it's surprising, you don't expect it. That is a myth. I mean, it, it can happen like that, of course, but for many people, creativity is work in a way. You build up these routines, you know, you're a morning person, you wake up before everyone else, you start writing, you push yourself, you write those two pages or whatever, you go on. Routines are key for creativity. They're not the opposite of creativity, but you have to get into a pattern of activity. So I think that pattern can easily connect to the natural world, of course, and, and to something that is very personal to you, but it is patterned in any case. Nice. I like that. Um, do you know the, do you know who James Hillman is? James Hellman, psychology. Really. He was uh, kind of a student of Carl Jung. Okay, that that I do know, and and I'm in Switzerland, so <laughs> yeah, I should know about yeah. Carl Jung. <laughs> so so the school that I went to here in California, mm -hmm. right? Um, this guy James Hillman was one of the founders of the school. It's called Pacifica uh -huh. Graduate Institute, 
So I've read many of his books. I've seen many of his lectures. Um, he used to teach at uh, in Zurich for like mm -hmm. 20 years, you know, at the Jung Foundation or whatever. Um, right. But what you said reminded me of something he said, because you, you mm -hmm. just, said, um, you know, we like to talk about creativity in terms of society and culture, but we don't necessarily plant it in the world too. Mm -hmm. And I, one talk he gave when people kept asking him questions about mind versus body what you know is this in the body and that's in the mind and he's like isn't this also body like why are we making a distinction between mind and body this is your body too right that's right funny. yeah no absolutely i mean it's it's very embodied you know and and we miss that a lot i i come back to this idea of materiality the materiality of creating because if you look like if you google um templates on or if you, if you search the internet for like powerpoint or whatever templates you have the light bulb the light bulb is such a a emblem of creativity the lit light bulb usually the standing alone light bulb and so on but if you think about it, what what does this metaphor tell us is that creativity is just in the moment Moment. And where is the history behind that moment? What happens before? What happens after? You know, so it's it's a very both individualizing and atemporal view of creativity. So again, where is the body? Where are the habits? Where, where is where is life and culture and everything around that? It's just the click. There is a click uh, for sure, but it's much more contextual and embodied than that. Mm -hmm. Totally. Um, do you see a connection between creativity and sleep or dreams? Mm. Well, I, you know, I, it would be foolish of me not to see any connection, knowing that many artists and many, many individuals build on their dreams to, to create. And some people keep dream diaries, which seem to be very useful. I, I don't do that personally. Uh, but, uh, but I think, you know, if you go into more psychoanalytical views of the mind, then we, we can get into how we talked about experience and the fact that we build on experience. A lot of that life experience is not accessible to us, uh, you know, for a variety of reasons. I mean, some more purist Freudian theorists would talk about repression and how you're not in touch with different sides of yourself because you reject them, but maybe because we can't really process all of that information. So I think when we dream, uh, you know, I mean, there, there are many views and theories of that, but one dominant way would be to say that we we actualize sides of our experience that we kind of process and work through. And, and there is some uniqueness to those aspects. And then if we do remember them and carry them forward, I think that could be amazing resources for creativity. I don't know if everyone uses that, but I obviously there is an unconscious dynamic to the creative process and then dreams um, fundamentally relate to that. Excellent. Um... My, I, I always tell people, my idea for doing this right. pulled me out of the bed at four in the morning one night. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, there, there is so example. <laughs> yeah. But it's, it, you know, it's, it's it, absolutely, I, I think, you know, we, we are much more in touch with our, so, some kind of deeper images or deeper, deeper motivations that we, we often don't allow ourselves to think about. I think that's an interesting idea about the creative process, because if we want to be original and, and just get away a bit out of convention, what are our resources, right? So we have to kind of reconnect with ourselves and dreams might be one way, or we have to invite accidents and, and chance and serendipity into the process. So we, we just present ourselves with, we put ourselves in situations that are unique and therefore we wait for something unique to happen as well. Mm -hmm. um, here's something I just thought. Right. Maybe I should have thought of this well, well before, but going back to the idea of you know, something is creative when it's novel and it's new. Mm -hmm. Personally, as an artist, I don't see anything new. Mm -hmm. There are no new ideas. It's like right. people have, people will make combinations of new things. All right. But they're, you know, like a hero yeah. or a sunrise, like those are not new ideas, but you could paint a new sunrise and it could be amazing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But also, uh, in my mind just now, being a Jungian, yeah. to my mind, I'm like, of course there's nothing new because they're all archetypes. <laughs> right, like, right. These are archetypal things. Right. So you know, people can have their own, like, new spin on it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
I don't know. What do you think about that? Yeah, no, I, I, I think it's a very, very good point. You know, I, I was talking about, we're talking about this dual uh, definition of creativity that portrays it as the sweet spot between novelty and usefulness. Usually something that is very, very radically novel uh, might be bordering the bizarre because you, you have nothing too, too useful to do with it if it pushes too much on that side. But if it's very, very useful and meaningful, it might be just conventional. It might be something we know about and we've done for many, many years, right? So creativity is kind of the sweet spot. What we notice with creativity tests very often is that actually when you rate ideas or objects, products, whatever, there sometimes is a conflict between the two. Something moves either towards one or the other. It's quite rare that something is both extremely meaningful and extremely novel. So I think that's kind of the, the unicorn or whatever whatever space of creativity we're, we're kind of after most of the times. But in Western culture especially, we have this obsession with novelty at the expense of meaningfulness. And, and, and that's how in Eastern spaces and other cultural spaces actually incremental creativity and kind of the small steps and the, the combinations you talked about, that's the real creativity, not just this radical innovation that says away with the old, let me break completely free. And as you said, that that is a myth because you can never, never break completely free from any, you know, from, from experience. Again, we go back to that. There is no radical novelty, but there are combinations that are surprising and, and, and they are new enough that they trigger us and they excite us. And, and there will always be millions and billions of new combinations of ideas possible. So that makes creativity exciting because while there is no radical, fully, you know, out of human experience type of novelty, within human experience, we have so much to build on that, that, that you know, we spend lifetimes and people do, artists do, and, and you would as well, right? Uh, just building on that. Nice. Well, I agree with yeah, I agree with what you just said. <laughs> um, question number six out of seven here. Right. Are creative people mad? Are creative ah. people mad? <laughs> I, I'm going to tackle that in the film because well, I don't want to say what I think. But anyway, they, they can, creative people can be driven mad or can drive mad some other people. I, I think I mean there is work done on that, and I think what happens is that often we conflate. You know, we, we take these um, iconic cases of big creators who sometimes do have some kind of mental illness, or sometimes their creativity drives them to present parts of themselves that look abnormal or irregular. But I think what research says is that we, we don't have that as a law. You, you don't have to be mad, inverted commas, to be creative. You can be creative, you know, being, you know, functioning mentally in a very normal way. But I think there is a deeper link here. You know, when we talk about madness, whatever, however we define it, we talk about abnormality. And creativity is also a process that is kind of abnormal or at least try to, tries to go beyond the normal. So I think there is a kernel there of you know, going beyond the convention, going beyond the expected. So obviously, you know, you would think that, yeah, if, if you if you if you're inclined psychologically to do that, then maybe you'll be more creative. But I do want to remind people though that if if you have pathologies that are really exaggerated, go back to the definition of novelty and meaningfulness. You can produce extreme novelty not radical and absolute novelty, but extreme novelty, but you wouldn't have the capacity to anchor it back into what is meaningful. That's why, for instance, in, in Lausanne, not very far from where I am, you have this museum of uh, art brutes. So the art produced by mentally ill individuals, prisoners, you know, people who are very kind of less educated. And if you look at that museum, it's amazing because it's the whole ideology of raw creativity, something that comes from the person and sometimes from pathology very often. But look at the museum itself. You need translators of that creativity. You need curators who take that and present it to you and give meaning to it. So I think that madness could be part of the story of creativity, but often you need more than just that. You need a whole system that makes sense of what is happening and, and so on. So it, it's it's definitely not um, not a unique explanation or a single explanation or or it shouldn't be like the first factor we, we have in mind, but it does offer amazing themes to, to reflect on, I think, around what is normal, what is conventional, uh, what we accept and what, what we don't accept in society. Right. I think the idea of creative people is crazy. Mm. Come, it, it's kind of like, uh, like in newspapers. Yeah. The, the idea of if it bleeds, it leads. You know. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Uh, right. Things are more 
violent and crazy, people are going to read that. Uh, and to my mind, I'm like, that kind of comes out of uh, Vincent van Gogh. Right. A, a lot of it. Right. Claude Monet, you know, the, the guy who painted yeah. a little. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So everybody focuses on, Cla on uh, Vincent van Gogh because he wasn't famous. He was very crazy. He did cut his ear off. He did shoot himself. You know, these things. But <laughs> Monet was wildly famous and wealthy in his lifetime. He had a good marriage. He had a kid. He had a house north of Paris. With like, it was like a 40 room mansion with a gardens and stuff. Like he was very famous and very well off. And we, but we don't focus on him. We focus As on him. Right, exactly. I mean, he, he remains famous, but absolutely. I mean, and if you look at movies and popular culture, I think that contributes a lot to our imagery as well. And, you know, movies like A Beautiful Mind or, you know, very often if you have scientific discovery, you have the mad scientist or the mad artist or the mad genius. That, that's what captures our imagination. And, and it, it goes back a long way, uh, you know, just to give you a mythological perspective on that. Um, one of the oldest ideas of creativity, of course, comes from the Bible or, or, you know, ancient religions where we talk about the beginning of the world and how the divinity or divinities in plural generated, you know, this is, this is the big paradigm of creation. It's the creation of the world. I mean, what can be more creative than that? But beside that, if you look at Greek mythology, you have this figure of Prometheus. Prometheus was a titan and who stole fire from the gods and gave it to mankind. Fire is this um, metaphor for the creative spark. Basically, what Prometheus did was to give something that was so divine and spread it towards human and say, well, you can use it. You can be your own creators from now on. You know, I've given you fire so you can you can do that. So what happened to Prometheus? He was chained uh, and, and a vulture, Zeus's vulture, was eating his liver every day. So what we have here is an ancient warning. Don't be too much out there. But it's also a fascination with this this kind of figure of the maverick and the genius who is is kind of so out there that it, it captures us. And it's not by mistake, by the way, that when we move forward many centuries, um, Mary Shelley with Frankenstein, I think the subtitle of Frankenstein is is something related to Prometheus, the it myth of Prometheus. Most modern Prometheus. So, exactly, it's the romantic view of creating in an absolute way. And it does relate to madness and it does relate to punishment and to something that we are both kind of triggered by and afraid of. And, and that captures our imagination a lot for centuries for millennia, actually. Mm -hmm. um, before I get to the last question here, just in what we're saying here, what pops into my mind, I always like the idea of um, the, Indi the Hindu god Shiva. Mm. There's the Shiva Nataraja, which is where he's dancing. Right. He's got a drum, he's got a knife, he's got multiple arms, he's circled in flame. Um, that image to me, you know, like it looks chaotic and there's yeah. lots of things going on, but he's also dancing. It's a choreographed thing. Right. So like it holds that tension of chaos and choreography. Yeah, order and order. Absolutely. Yeah, order. A lot of, I mean, Prometheus also kind of brought order, but created disorder in the process of breaking, bringing order. And in, in Greek mythology, again, and, and if you're a Jungian, you probably, you know, you know all of these um, archetypes and all, but you have Apollo and you have Dionysus. So you have the, the god of sun, who is always kind of this uh, harmony and order. And then you have the disorder, the drunkenness, but the very productive emergent drunkenness. And then you see that through the history of humanity, you know, this tension, as you said, between equilibrium and disequilibrium. And they're both part of creativity. Absolutely. Yeah, totally. Okay, last question here. Yes. How do you see creativity helping us in the future? So how, how will creativity help humanity in the future? Oh, this is such a good question. Okay, I can tell you how it will not help us. And, and that's, you know, we have to begin with that. You know, we celebrate creativity. We have this romantic view of it as something always positive. And in many ways, it is positive. I mean, again, it helps us as, as creators, as people who express ourselves, but it can also lead to great destructions. And we see around that a lot of human creativity produces climate emergencies and financial havoc and, and you know, and, and maybe not the best reactions to pandemics and so on. So that those can be acts of creativity. So I think 
one of the first things we need is to tie creativity to ethics and to wisdom much more. I mean, there is a colleague, Robert Sternberg, who, who made famously this connection a long time ago, intelligence, creativity, wisdom. But I really think in this day and age, we need to think ethically about creating, not only that we have to express ourselves, but what does, what does our creativity do to other people and to the world we live in? I think that is a, a key guiding question. But there is some good news about that. You know, I, I, I come from a very sociocultural tradition, so I do believe strongly that we create with other people, we co-create, everything is collaborative in some way. So creativity has this pro-social kind of at least an angle into it of opening yourself to the experience of other people. So if we can tap into that, if we can connect better creativity with perspective taking and empathy, and again to wisdom, I think it can it can literally change the world. We need to we need to kind of build forms of creativity that, that are ethical and and kind of you know bring bring communities together instead of just celebrating unique individuals who break every rule possible those are to be celebrated in some ways for sure we we, we can't really ignore them and we shouldn't that's part of the history of humanity but i think in this day and age we're more connected than ever we face challenges that are bigger than ever i think it, it would be worth giving a shot to this community-based kind of you know we we forms of creativity instead of just the I. The, the moment, you know, it's only the I in creativity, um, selfishness and sometimes destruction follow quite close. And I think if we, if we develop this more holistic way, our creativity can literally transform the world. And I hope we do that. Excellent. <laughs> well, I, I sounded like a like a mad preacher from the desert. Use your no, creativity no. wisely, people. <laughs> <laughs> that's great oh, that was a great interview oh thank you so, thank you it was, it was very nice talking to you and, and yeah very stimulating questions god yeah why do we create and i love it <laughs> yeah well these, these questions yeah popped into my head that same night anyway <laughs> so thank you so much yeah. And I will I will send you a link to the book series, but also uh, maybe I, I want to share with you a PDF. I don't have it here. Oh yeah, no, I do. Just one one second. Okay. I recently I had this uh, very short book, so I don't know if you know Oxford. Oh, yeah. has a short introduction. So I, I wrote the one on creativity, and uh, some of your questions are actually my chapters because I, I put it on questions. Creativity, what is it? The who of creativity, the what of creativity, the how of creativity, the when and where of creativity, the why of creativity, creativity where to. So I'm gonna, <laughs> it's very short. It's like, a, it's a pocket book. Yeah, no, but I I'll like the series. I, I read a bunch of those for my uh, dissertation. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Well, hopefully you'll, you'll find this useful. So I'm gonna send you this as well. Great. All right. Thank you Perfect. so much. Have a good rest of the day and good luck with everything. We'll be in touch. Bye-bye.
staring into space. Yeah.